Thank you very much, Professor Harcourt. I was honored by Dean Levmore's invitation to give this lecture, and I'm always very happy to have an occasion to revisit the scenes of my adolescence. I matriculated in the so-called Hutchins College at, in 1946 and left with an MA in 1950, 1952. Those were the six richest and most stimulating years of my intellectual life, and I owe the University of Chicago an enormous debt. When I came to Chicago, John Dewey was still alive, but his influence had long since peaked. In those days, the best students in the university were sitting at the feet of Leo Strauss, who taught them that Plato had been magnificently right and Dewey dangerously wrong. Utility and truth, Strauss wrote, are two entirely different things. In recent decades, pragmatism has emerged from the shadows. Among those who have done the most to revive it is Richard Posner. I've learned a great deal from Judge Posner's books, and our philosophical outlook is pretty much the same. But we still disagree on certain issues, I'm going to use this lecture to explain why I think that on some of those issues, Dewey would have been on my side. Strauss wasn't the first German to be dismissive about pragmatism. <laughs> Georg Simmel described it as what the Americans were able to get out of Nietzsche. <laughs> Simmel was wrong if he thought that James and Dewey got ideas from Nietzsche, but he was right to see their views as overlapping with his. To my mind, the most important area of overlap is their opposition to positivism, to the idea that physical science can answer metaphysical questions by discovering the intrinsic nature of reality. All three philosophers, James, Dewey, and Nietzsche, wanted us to stop asking such questions, but James and Dewey did better than Nietzsche at formulating a coherent anti metaphysical anti-metaphysical view. That's because they were never tempted to adopt Nietzsche's dry, aloof, condescending attitude toward human beings' struggle for happiness. Instead, the pragmatists urged that we judge all philosophical views, including their own, by whether they aided in that struggle. They thereby achieved a consistency that Nietzsche never managed. Nietzsche is notorious for his vacillations. He wavers between criticizing the very idea of objective truth and proclaiming that his own views are objectively true and everybody else is objectively false. <laughs> On one page he tells us, I quote, we simply lack any organ for knowledge, for truth, we know or believe or imagine just as much as may be useful in the interests of the human herd. But a few pages earlier in the gay science he wrote, Quote, even we, godless anti-metaphysicians, still take our fire, too, from the flame lit by a faith that is thousands of years old, the faith of Plato, the truth is divine. At his best, however, Nietzsche explicitly rejected the sort of science worship that links much of 21st century analytic philosophy to 19th century positivism. When Nietzsche says there are no facts, only interpretations, and seems willing to admit that that goes for his own assertions as well, he's edging closer to the more coherent position that James and Dewey adopted. Both pragmatists would have agreed with him that, quote, a scientific interpretation of the world might therefore still be one of the most stupid of all possible interpretations, one of the poorest in meaning. Unfortunately, however, passages like that one are offset by bursts of positivistic raggedoctrio, as when Nietzsche writes, I quote, still the gay science, long live physics, and even more so that which compels us to turn to physics, our honesty. The best thing about pragmatism is that it does consistently what Nietzsche did only occasionally and half-heartedly. It abandons positivism's attempt to elevate science above the rest of culture. It rejects the quarrel between platonic immaterialism and Democritean materialism and all other metaphysical disputes because they are irrelevant to practice. Pragmatists substitute the question, which descriptions of the human situation are most useful for which human purposes for the question, 
which description tells us what that situation really is. Pragmatism thus puts natural science on all fours with politics and art. It treats science as one more source of suggestions about what we human beings might do with ourselves. We might, for example, colonize the planets of other stars, or we might tweak our genes in order to give birth to Ibermenschen. But we might instead try to equalize the life chances of rich children and poor children. Or we might try to, try to make our lives into works of art. Philosophers, do we thought, should consider the relative merits of such proposals. But they should not try to ground a choice between them on knowledge of what human beings really are. For, as Dewey said, I quote, the term reality is a term of value or choice. Philosophy, he concluded, I quote again, is not in any sense whatever a form of knowledge. It is rather, quote, a social hope reduced to a working program of action, a prophecy of the future. If you agree with Dewey, as I do, about what philosophy is good for, you will see contemporary philosophy in the English-speaking world as a contest between the heirs of Kant and the heirs of Hegel. Present-day neo-Kantians try to grasp the human situation and to practice moral philosophy without reference to history. The neo-Hegelians, on the other hand, hope to grasp the present historical moment in thought in order to formulate better prophecies of better futures. Dewey praised Hegel for having recognized that, as Dewey put it, quote, the moral consciousness of the individual is but a phase in the process of social organization. Dewey thought that the way to do moral philosophy was to compare alternative programs of action and alternative prophecies. But among present day fans of Dewey, there is still plenty of disagreement about what programs of action follow from his pragmatist philosophy. Cheryl Misak and Robert Westbrook, for example, claim that Dewey argued successfully from a pragmatist view of truth and knowledge to the need for deliberative democracy. Misak urges that a pragmatist approach to knowledge provides argumentative ammunition against, for example, fascists and religious fundamentalists. Westbrook says, quote, pragmatist epistemology alone is enough to provide grounds for criticism of those who refuse to open themselves to the widest possible range of experience and argument, and then claims that deliberative democracy is the only form of government that provides the maximum amount of openness. Judge Posner and I do not think that pragmatist epistemology is up to the jobs that Misak and Westbrook think it can perform. Westbrook ruefully notes, I quote, no pragmatist has worked harder to break the link between pragmatism and deliberative democracy than Richard Posner. I agree with Posner when he writes, quote, the bridge Dewey tried to build between epistemic and political democracy is too flimsy to carry heavy traffic. Dewey's attempts to build that bridge were, I think, half-hearted and spasmodic. As long as he defined democracy merely as, quote, a name for a life of free and enriching communion, it was easy for him to argue that the cause of democracy might be assisted if we abandoned both metaphysics and the correspondence theory of truth. One can agree, whole, but, sorry, but it is a long, a long way from recommending such a life to the claim that the masses should have a larger role in forming public policy. One can agree wholeheartedly with Dewey about the nature of truth, knowledge, and inquiry, and nevertheless believe that what Posner describes as, quote, our present system of elective aristocracy is the best form of government we can hope for. But though Posner and I agree on this point, we disagree about another deeper issue. We both think that Hegel and Dewey were right to view the moral consciousness of the individual as a matter of internalized social norms, but we disagree about whether our norms are better than those of our ancestors. Posner rejects the idea that we have made moral progress. I think that at that point he is relapsing from the true Deweyan faith into positivistic science worship. 